Howdy. There's someone I wanted to make a bow for. And with the materials I had available, I thought it would be a good idea to take the opportunity and make a bow using the instructions from Outdoor Survival Skills by Larry Dean Olson. These bows are pretty simple to make. They may not last as long. As a matter of fact, even the book says that Native American flat bows are better. But for a beginner, it's simpler to make and it doesn't take as much time, which is good because most new bow makers break a few bows before they finally get one that works. That's just part of the process. And this doesn't need a lot of tools. As a matter of fact, the book explicitly warns against using a knife, but most people are gonna use a knife. So I'm gonna compromise. The tools I'm gonna to be using are a Swiss Army knife, some broken pieces of glass, and a rock with a rough edge. I'm doing this in my backyard. So I'm putting my bottle in a bag and I'm gonna break it against a rock. The bag just keeps all the glass together and keeps it from getting into the dirt so my kids don't cut their feet. And what you get from doing that essentially is a bag full of cabinet scrapers. So you wanna take your rock and smooth down all the jagged edges on the corners of the glass. You actually don't need to do much to the main part because most of the time it breaks on a square edge, as you can see if you look there. And that makes a perfect cabinet scraper. You can see here, just hold it at a 90 degree angle to the wood and it shaves the wood right away. This is one area where I'm varying from the book just a little bit because the book tells you that glass works if you can't find any obsidian or nappable stone, but I prefer glass. And as you can see, after you do it for a while, it starts to make little bumps in the wood. And that will end up messing up your edge. You can see those bumps here. So that's where your rock comes in, and it's essentially sandpaper. Use your rock to rough that down and smooth everything. Then you've got a clean surface to shave or whittle on. Reading directly from the book now, the bow length should be approximately 44 inches, but this will vary with each person. A good method of determining bow length is to hold the stave on a horizontal plane, extending from the left shoulder to the fingertips of the extended right arm. I like to give mine just a little push out, make it just a little longer as you can see there. The measurement of a bow will vary with the available wood supply, but too often staves are selected that are too large in diameter. The best diameter is from one to two inches at the hand grip. This must be determined before the bark is removed. When trimming your bow stave to length, it's important to cut all the way through the material and to cut it cleanly because if you make it crack, you could ruin your bow. So after that, I did two things. I determined the natural bend of the bow and I found the centerpiece for the hand grip. From the pages, every stave, no matter how straight, has a natural bend to it that can be determined by placing the butt end on the ground and holding the stave vertical with the left hand in the middle where the hand grip will be. The bow maker grasps the tip of the stave with the right hand and pulls it toward him lightly. The stave will turn in his left hand and settle into the natural bend. The side of the stave facing away from him then becomes the back of the bow. Next, find the center of your bow. I personally like to measure mine, but you don't necessarily have to. So as I'm looking at the wood here, I can see rises and dips in the surface of the wood. And I'm going to have to follow this to a point. Otherwise, it'll create weak spots and my bow could break. To paraphrase the book here, you want to do one half of the bow at a time. You want to pretty much be done with your top half before you start on your bottom half. Otherwise, it could end up taking away too much material and one side of your bow will be weaker. From the pages, the actual trimming and shaping should not be done by whittling. Rather, the excess wood should be scraped off in long, even strokes from the hand grip to the tips. A piece of flint, agate, jasper, or obsidian does the best job, but broken glass and steel knife blades are also effective. However, the bow maker using a steel knife blade is often strongly tempted to speed up the process by whittling with it. Now, I am using a knife, but here's the danger that the book talks about. Your blade will catch the grain, and if you're not careful, you could gouge out a chunk of the belly of your bow. When you start to feel your knife blade catching in the grain, stop. Turn it around, trim it, get it nice and smooth, and keep your knife extra sharp, and it will reduce the risk of that happening.
So you don't want to try to bend the bow limb, but it's okay to flex it a little bit to see how even your taper is. And you can see I've got a stiff spot right in the middle there, and it doesn't show up, but I marked it with a pencil to try to show the camera. So what I'm going to do now is take a piece of glass and scrape down past, past the pencil, basically just taking that top layer of wood off. You want to be really careful when you're doing that because it's easy to go too far in the other direction and you could end up with a hinge or a weak spot in the belly of your bow. And you can see how well that piece of glass cuts into that wood. It works really well. Just give it another flex to see how my tiller is looking. It can sometimes help to run your hands and fingers along the wood as you're working it. So you can actually feel the high and low spots in the material as you, as you run your hand over it. And I've got a high spot here and a low spot right there. Now, as I'm working this material, if you look at the back of this bow, I mentioned this earlier, you can see that it's not perfectly flat. There's high spots and low spots in it. And I need to try to make my taper in my bow limb follow those high and low spots in the back of the bow. Otherwise, I'm just going to have the same problems as I would if I left high and low spots in the belly of my bow. So this is a piece of hazel that seasoned for over a year, it seasoned for about a year in the woods. Then I finally brought it home about six months ago. When it comes to bow material selection, whatever was used traditionally in your area will probably work. Uh, as far as the book goes, it says, the finest woods for making bows include mountain mahogany, ash, service berry, and choke cherry. A sapling burned by a brush fire is an excellent bow wood. Many trees uprooted by wind also have well-seasoned branches, but a dead tree with its roots still in the ground may be too brittle or weather split to use unless it has been killed by fire. Since pre-seasoned wood is rare in the wilderness, green wood usually has to fill the need, and if carefully cured, it is superior to other woods. A straight stave that is free from knots and small branches should be selected, and the stave should be carefully cut clear through not broken off. It is a wise survivor who selects two or three staves to work with. Once the staves are selected and measured, the bark should be scraped off and the staves left overnight in a cool, dry place. The staves must not be exposed to sunlight for the first six hours after the bark is removed. So leaving the instructions of the book for a minute, I feel comfortable that this bow limb is completed enough. It's almost done that I can start on the bottom limb now. And anything that still needs to be done to it can be done in the final tillering process, which I'll do after I put the string on the bow. So basically, with the bottom limb, you're going to do the exact same thing you did with the top limb. And since you have more material to work with, you may be tempted to just start hacking away at it with your pocket knife. But if you look here, I straight up wedged my knife in the grain of this wood. So you still need to be careful. Just because there's more wood doesn't mean you can't still make mistakes. So take your time, and if you feel yourself starting to get in a hurry, just set it down and walk away for a little while. That's better than breaking it and having to start over. The bow's mostly done now, so if you're working with green wood, you want to set it up in a cool, dry place somewhere for a couple of days and let it cure. So after your bow has seasoned for a couple days, you want to take it back out and you can get ready to put the string on. I personally like to put a notch on one end and permanently tie the string to the other end. And the way you do that is just cut your notch on one end, obviously, but the other end, uh, I follow the instructions in the book, and that is to rough up the belly of the bow. You still don't want to mess with the back of it and smear it with pine sap. And what you're doing is you're making a very sticky surface for your string to attach to. And on the end with the notch, I'm going to do the same thing and I'm going to wrap it with sinew. But if you don't have any sinew, any small diameter strong cordage will work 
if it's something that stretches, just make sure you pre-stretch it. And you can do that just by hanging it up with a heavy weight on the end of it. And here's what you're looking for. Now, the book says to do this going down about three inches. Since this bow is meant to be a gift, I'm recycling a bowstring off of one of my other bows. But in the past for bows like the one I'm building, I have used paracord, artificial sinew. I have one now in my garage that I made with a two ply reverse wrap bank line that works pretty good. The book favors a sinew bowstring, but I don't have enough sinew for that. So the first time you string a bow is the scariest part of building one. And as you can see, looking at this one, it's got some pull to it. Now, once I get it strong, you'll see that there's not much brace height on this bow. Brace height is the distance between the string and the handle. But you want to string it lightly. You want to look at it and see where the stiff areas are, where it's bending evenly, where you might need to take more weight off. And if you do find you need to take off more material, it's important to be very careful not to remove too much because your bow is pretty much done at this point. And if you take off too much, then you could ruin it by making it too weak on one side. So I think I'm pretty much done. Just giving it one final look. Everything looks like it's been in pretty evenly, at least for my skill level. I'm not an expert. But uh, yeah, I think we're good. So living in town at my backyard, I don't have a campfire, so I just stuck it in the oven in order to heat it up. And the book says it needs to be rubbed with all the animal fat it can absorb. I'm just using olive oil, but what you're doing is just waterproofing and sealing the wood, making it, giving it some protection from the elements. And to paraphrase the book on this step, rub it until your arm gets sore. Uh, what I'm doing is using the smooth side of the handle of my Swiss Army knife to burnish the wood, really compress all those fibers and just really help to to seal everything in and strengthen the wood. And just settle in and watch a movie because you're going to be doing this for a while. So one last thing I did with this bow is to stain it with a mix of charcoal and a little bit of watered down glue. And you can see my form's pretty crappy but the bow itself is performing pretty well. I just grabbed some random arrows from my garage just to give it a test shot to see how it does. So the reason I wanted to make this bow for that person instead of another flat bow or something like that is because this is a great bow to learn how to make bows on. And that's what that person was trying to do. Even though it's a quote unquote survival bow, you don't need a big log to make this bow or a bunch of tools, just a two inch diameter suitable piece of wood a few pieces of glass, a pocket knife, and a rock. And you've got a real bow that is capable of taking big game. I took it down to the, a local archery range and had this one tested. And it shoots 35 pounds at 20 inches. That's 5 pounds under the legal limit in my state for deer hunting. But that's plenty good for rabbit hunting or other kind of small game. So... To the person that I made this bow for, I really hope you enjoy it. And for everybody else, I appreciate you watching. Have a good one.